Well, welcome back. Thanks for joining me. Today's lesson will deal with the difference between allotropes and something that students think sounds similar, alloys. So we'll sort of explain the difference between those. Now, in past lessons, we had discussed how elements are found. They are either diatomic, that means they're found in pairs, and there's seven elements that are found naturally in nature that come in pairs, and those are hydrogen, oxygen, bromine, fluorine, iodine, nitrogen, and chlorine. I refer to these as the Hoberfinkel twins. It's just a neat way for me to remember. They come in pairs, and it sounds like somebody's name, the Hoberfinkel twins. I'm just sounding that out. Of course, you can rearrange that and make the Brinkelhoff brothers, if you like to say Brinkelhoff brothers more than Hoberfinkel twins, or just memorize them. It's your choice. Now, there are two elements that are found in larger groupings. They're called polyatomic elements, and here they are. P4, that's phosphorus, and S8, that's sulfur. Sulfur always comes in groups of eight. It's called rhombic sulfur, and phosphorus uh, always comes in groups of four. Um, now, the way I remember this is when I write a letter and I forget to put something at the end, I have to put PS. And, and PS means postscript, but here it refers to phosphorus and sulfur. And so how do I know how many of each? Well, the sulfur, if you make the letter S multiple times, it looks like you're making an 8 when you do that. So sulfur comes in 8, and I can't really help you on this one, but I know it comes before the sulfur. So the fact that it comes before the sulfur, maybe that's how I'm going to remember it has four phosphorus. Now, I've written down a couple definitions that I found online. So here's the online version of an allotrope. Each of two or more different physical forms in which an element can exist. So in other words, an element, even though it's, it's, we think of it as a single thing, can be put together and grouped together in more than one way. So we're going to look at a couple of examples. We'll look at the example of the element carbon. And carbon can form graphite, charcoal, or diamond. Those are three different allotropic forms. They're all carbon in the solid state, but because of the way they're bonded together, their crystalline structure, they have very, very different properties. Diamonds are extremely hard and have very high melting points. Graphite, on the other hand, is very soft, and even though they're made of the same elements. Another example of an allotrope that perhaps you've heard of would be oxygen gas, what we breathe, and ozone. Ozone is the protective layer of three atoms of oxygen bonded together that protect us from harmful ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun. And so these are both examples of allotropes of oxygen. Another one that you're less familiar with would be phosphorus. There's two allotropes of phosphorus, red phosphorus and white phosphorus. At the beginning of this unit, we had talked about lighting a match and that one of the reactants you needed was red phosphorus. What color is red phosphorus? Red, of course. And what color is white phosphorus? No, it is not white. It's yellow. I don't know why they call it that. It's kind of dumb. Now, red phosphorus we use for matches relatively safe. White phosphorus, not safe. There are what are called 13 devil chemicals that a high school chem teacher cannot have in their classroom. And white phosphorus is one of those devil chemicals. Now, one time I was at a workshop. It was uh, I was an early teacher my first year or two, and they sent me to a workshop on chemical safety. And I sat in the front row because I wanted to get as much as I could from the discussion. And a very old man starts walking up very slowly to the podium, just painfully slow to watch this man walk. And then he had a big fat book and he set it on the table on the podium. And then he said, and he talked very slowly, I'm going to discuss all the new safety regulations with you and you and you and all of you that will affect you in your classroom. 
and it was so painfully slow I wanted to get up and go but I didn't and then he says let's get started I have this book and I need to read to you all of the new regulations and I'm thinking oh my god I'm gonna be here for a long time and as he opens the book up the book bursts into flames giant flames come shooting out of this book now at that point I was pretty mesmerized by what was going on I think I turned to the teacher next to me and I said what is that he's doing how's he doing that and this particular teacher had a little bit more experience than me he said I believe it's white phosphorus and white phosphorus when it is exposed to air spontaneously catches on fire and then after about 10 seconds the, the elderly man closed the book and the flame went out now what he had done is he had taken a book and cut out all the pages and lined it with metal and he put white phosphorus in there so as long as the book was closed there was no oxygen it wouldn't burn as soon as he opened it up it would burn then he went on and gave a very good discussion of the regulations he was actually a very dynamic speaker and all the beginning stuff was just sort of uh, a set induction to sort of throw us off a little bit and it certainly worked now white phosphorus even though I can't get it you can get it if you join the military they will give you white phosphorus grenades as well as you know if you join the army or air force any of those now years ago when uh, when Taiwan China wanted Taiwan uh, well I'll just say it this way we spy on our enemies we spy on our friends so we were spying on China and China didn't like that and so we were flying overhead and they sent up some aircrafts and said you're gonna land or we're gonna shoot you down because we were over Chinese airspace without permission and the young pilots in the, the Air Force they did just that they landed the plane because they didn't want to get shot down now once they landed the airplane this was a spy plane it had tons of information inside it that we had been collecting so after they landed on the tarmac what they did is they got off all except the last individual and then that person took a white phosphorus hand grenade and threw it into the aircraft and it burned the aircraft right on the tarmac down to nothing so that the Chinese couldn't get any information they held our soldiers for uh, a few days and then there was a diplomatic solution they were released now the the point about white phosphorus grenade is it burns spontaneously it cannot be put out with simple water it will just burn and so that's what uh, soldiers have white phosphorus grenades for they also make tremendous smoke screens if you're trying to be deceptive and they also can light up the night sky because they burn incredibly bright kind of like a magnesium flash bulb so you can look up white phosphorus if you're curious about it look it up on Wikipedia find out a little bit more about it but white phosphorus and red phosphorus are two different allotropes of phosphorus even though they're the same element and they have the same number of atoms the way they're put together makes them act differently structure leads to function if you're in junior high and you're six foot eight and you're 14 years old uh, and you're relatively athletic probably the NBA is going to be relatively interested in you I'm pretty sure that the uh, people at you know horse racing are not going to be interested in you as a jockey at that height so structure leads to function that applies to both people as well as I suppose chemicals here's another definition from a from an online source of an allotrope allotropy is the property of some chemicals chemical elements to exist in two or more different forms in the same physical state and these would be then considered elements so the key is they're the same elements in the same state of matter either all solids or all liquids or all gases but they have different properties different chemical properties uh, here's a final definition the existence of a chemical element in two or more forms which may differ in the arrangement of atoms and crystalline solids or in the occurrence of molecules that contain different number of atoms so for us if we're keeping it real simple allotropes are different forms of the same element now let's just compare that to an alloy and then we'll get into the rest of the lesson so an alloy is a metal made by combining multiple metals and melting them together so for instance brass 
is an alloy. 14 karat gold is an alloy. Stainless steel is an alloy. Anytime you combine metals, you will have different properties. Usually you do this to increase their strength or their resistance to corrosion. Uh, these would be examples of alloys. Pewter is another example of an alloy. And the only reason I put an alloy on this sheet was clearly allotrope and alloy look kind of similar. Or if you think of the word allotropy, meaning allotrope and alloy, they can be easily confused. So I wanted to make sure we know the difference. All right, so I mentioned earlier that white phosphorus and red phosphorus are two allotropes of phosphorus. And red phosphorus is what we use in matches, and white phosphorus is the stuff that burns in air spontaneously. And if you were to look at the structure, it's four atoms of phosphorus put together. And at this point, I'm not going to be too concerned about the difference in how red and white phosphorus look. I just want to mention that those are allotropes. Uh, this is now just looking at a crystal of table salt. It is not an allotrope, but I do want to talk a little bit about how atoms can be packed together because they can be put together differently. In sodium chloride, you have, if we look right here, we have the Na, excuse me, the Cl1 minus, and next to it on this plane is a sodium ion, a sodium ion, a sodium ion, and a sodium ion. So it's surrounded by an opposite charge. And that's what you'll see in each case. If we look here, when you're looking at this sodium, it's surrounded by a chlorine, a chlorine, and a chlorine. And so it gets locked into a very rigid structure. So here is your NaCl packed together. It, this is showing how the atoms might be linked together. Can you start to see why table salt always is a little perfect cube? Right? If we were to look at it, and, and there is maybe the visualized cube of salt, that's a, an electron picture, electron microscope picture of an actual crystal of sodium chloride. And again, it's due to the lattice structure, L-A-T-T-I-C-E, uh, or how those atoms are put together. Water, on the other hand, when it forms ice, has a different structure. You see the waters forming. You've got H2, here's an H2O, and then you have another water, and then that little, those little dots, those weak attractions between there, that's hydrogen bonding. That's what makes the water stick together. We call that why it has surface tension. And then these spaces in between, these are called interstitial spaces, and that's where different things can dissolve in water. They fit in there. Oxygen can be dissolved in water. Salt can be dissolved in water. Sugar can be dissolved in water. Lots of different things. So structure is something that chemists are concerned about uh, when, they, when they make molecules. I wish it was snowing. No, I don't. I'm happy to have summer right now, aren't you? When we're in the winter, it's kind of miserable and gray. All right. Here's another structure. This is uh, just showing dry ice or carbon dioxide. So the black must represent the carbon, the red is the oxygen, so CO2. And it is in a solid form, so it all groups together. This is not a compound, so it doesn't have a formal structure, but instead this is a molecule. We'll discuss in our bonding unit the difference between compounds and molecules. And it has to do with how they're bonded together. Molecules are covalently bonded together, and ions or compounds are bonded together by ionic substances or ionic bonds. All right, well, let's talk about allotropes of carbon. At school, I have these as three dimensional molecules I can show you, but here I just have uh, these little drawings to show you. So here's graphite. You can imagine. You're going to have to really use your imagination that I'm holding up a pencil here. I know it's a pen. But if we were to look very carefully at the tip of that pen, what we would notice is that there are sheets, flat little sheets of carbon laid out. And so if this is the paper and this is the pencil, when you push down on the pencil, you actually break these dashed lines, these chemical bonds between the layers of the graphite. 
and then this bottom sheet of graphite smears on the paper and then the next level of graphite gets pushed down and then this smears on the paper and then this smears and that's how graphite or a pencil works. Now if we look carefully at it we would see there's this hexagonal pattern within there that can actually be seen from this drawing. It definitely cannot be seen but it appears in the diamond. But diamond is put together structurally very differently than graphite and that's what gives it different properties. It's the hardest material on most scale of hardness, right? Diamond, things like that. Now a buckyball or a Buckminster fullerene is a well it looks almost like a soccer ball arrangement of carbon atoms. This is a newer form of carbon. It was discovered in the 70s. They thought perhaps that uh, buckyballs would be uh, a fantastic way to hide medicine in the body. We'll talk a little bit about that, but it hasn't worked out. Now maybe where you've seen this before is at Epcot. At Epcot you have that big white building and it looks like the shape of a buckyball. Or maybe when you were a little kid when you went to the playground, I don't think they have these anymore, but if you cut this in half it was something that you could hang on and climb all over. It's a very strong shape. In fact, uh, when you go to space, when we colonize space, this is probably a design they will use because the sphere has the largest amount of surface inside there of usable space. And of course, there's only two pieces. There's the atom and then the connector. So it's very easy to make. Now, there are C60s, icosahedrons, and C80s. There's different arrangements of buckyballs. Again, uh, it's an allotrope of carbon. So there are three different forms of carbon in the solid state. One of them, again, is carbon. I've showed you that. And this is a piece of graphite. Again, it's what's in the tip of a pencil. And it looks very different than a diamond. Diamonds have very different structures. And, and now you can start to see, let me go back here, you see this one, two, three, four, five, six, these six, this hexagonal ring here? And these are on flat planes separated. Now look at the diamond. See the one, two, three, four, five, six rings showing there? And but but they look a little bit different. When you rotate these, when you see these molecules together, a diamond looks very different than graphite. Now a flawless diamond would be made only of carbon. But instead of maybe having carbon here, if I substitute cobalt, that diamond might have a slightly blue color because cobalt has a blue color. So there are no such thing as perfect diamonds. They all have flaws, kind of like teachers and students. We all, none of us are perfect, right? And so there's our diamonds. And they can only be broken on certain planes, which is why you have like princess cut diamond and I don't know all the different cuts. Uh, but but they have can only be made a few different ways. One of the most famous diamonds is called the Hope Diamond. It's a giant blue diamond. I don't know, it's like 1500 carats or something. It's huge. And evidently it's cursed. It's in the Smithsonian and it's very, very dark blue. There was once a student, uh, this was probably 25 years ago, and the student had read an article uh, that a, a Russian person had found diamonds in a blast furnace. Uh, that's an industrial furnace that burns trash. And this person thought, well that's pretty cool. I might want to try to make that. So the person actually had an oxyacetylene torch in their garage and they started burning wood and burned it for a very long time and once it turned to ash kept heating it up. And when they were done, they had actually found gem quality diamonds. Now that's pretty cool. This person actually won the Westinghouse Scholarship it's the equivalent of the Nobel Prize, I suppose, for high school students. And then went on to uh, a, a very nice college, MIT. Now, I remember the first time I saw artificial diamonds made that were gem quality using this method. And it's this, this method is called deposition, where you heat up carbon to the gaseous state, and then you let it cool off very rapidly, and it goes directly from the solid into, excuse me, from the solid, third try, from the gas to the solid state 
and it forms the allotrope diamond. So I was at University of Illinois at an engineering open house and there was a, a card table sitting out there and it had a microscope and it said gem quality diamonds. And you had to look through the microscope and there was a little arrow pointing to it. It was magnified like 800 times and there's a little black area and that evidently was the gem quality diamond that was produced. I wasn't very impressed, but that's how we make diamonds for drill bits and other things. See, if you're using a drill bit on metal, metal friction of a drill bit on a metal surface gets very, very hot. And most metals will soften and then you will lose the cutting tip. So they engineer the tip of that. They add different things like they might add to the iron they'll add an element like tungsten and tungsten will, is the highest melting point metal and it will make it so it won't soften and then they'll also coat the tip with diamonds and they call those uh, tungsten carbide drill bits and they can heat up very very hot to a thousand degrees or more and they don't soften now you pay quite a bit more to have that drill bit but it'll last a lifetime the disadvantage of a carbide bit is because they've engineered it, it becomes very, very brittle. If you drop a normal steel bit, nothing happens. If you were to drop a carbide steel bit on concrete, it will oftentimes shatter or at least break. So we can change, engineering can change the properties of elements by the alloys, by adding different things to it. And that's a whole area of science is chemical engineering and the production of different alloys for industrial purposes. And then finally, here is our buckyball. I've got a C60 and a C70 uh, mentioned here. There are different types that you can make. And again, it, this looks kind of like uh, a soccer ball from the early 2000s, I suppose. Right Now they have a little bit different shape to them, but that was when I was a kid, that's what soccer balls look like. Now you can actually if you were to cut that soccer ball in half, you can then elongate the pack, the, the tube, and you make a bucky tube or a nano tube. And that's what they might look like. Now, these are thousands of times thinner than a human hair. And you can actually make wires out of these things that just take a very few electrons to make current go through them. So this might be promising in the future for a way to make circuits extremely small, extremely efficient, is to use nanotubes instead of actual wires in there. So this is an area of active research. It currently is not being done, but maybe in the future, maybe you'll be the person to figure this engineering out. I mentioned that also they thought these might be used in the human body to, live, to deliver medicine. If you put a foreign body in your body, your body makes an antibody to it. Now carbon is not foreign to your body, so if you were to swallow the buckyball and then put something inside it, maybe that could then be used in your body to treat the human body a little bit differently. That hasn't worked out very well. It was an early thought, um, but again, it's, it's not working out. One thing they do use uh, graphite for. Maybe you have a Pinewood Derby car, those little cars that you race for Cub Scouts. If you put graphite on the wheels, they will spin much faster. Or maybe your lock on your house, the key doesn't work very well anymore. Go ahead and squirt a little graphite in there and it will act as a dry lubricant to make that lock spin a little bit better. So that's some uses of graphite. All right. Well, let's talk now about alloys. So I think you have understand now what an allotrope is, different forms of an element. So now let's talk about what is an alloy. Well, let's pick gold for example. Um, I have a gold ring here and this gold ring is 20 karat gold. It's nearly pure gold. Now the problem with gold that's this pure is that you can't see it but the ring is all scratched up on the outside but nice and shiny on the inside. If it were pure gold, it would be called 24 karat gold. That would mean if I were to sample 24 atoms out of that ring, all 24, 100% would be gold. 
Now the problem with gold jewelry that's 24 karat gold is if they're pierced earrings if you lay down on them you will bend the post and that's no good or if you have a, a bangle a ring around your your wrist and you bump into stuff it's too soft too malleable and it will distort and deform too easily so oftentimes you will find something like 14 karat gold and that's what most wedding bands are made of and most jewelry is 14 karat gold that means 14 out of the 24 atoms are gold the other 10 can be anything you want in America we tend to add copper or silver um, we tend to put more silver than copper in and so gold sold in America is a little bit lighter golden color if you buy your gold from the Middle East they tend to use more copper and it looks more golden a darker golden color there's really not a big difference in value I know silver is more valuable than gold but the gold is really what gives the the uh, jewelry its value or the way it's been shaped 18 karat gold then obviously 18 out of the 24 atoms would be gold the more gold you have in there the softer the jewelry will be you can have six karat gold and it will still look very pretty and it'll be very hard won't scratch and it'll stay shiny so for most things you don't need a high gold content in them hope that makes some sense in what that say when they say 24 karat gold or 14 karat gold you have a little better understanding of that okay um, if you look at brass I'll give you a little story here years ago uh, I taught with a guy and he was always the most positive person I love going to work because he was always so positive positive. and uh, he was doing some home improvement and, and he knows I'm pretty handy and so he was putting in a toilet and was asking me for any advice so I explained how to do that for him and so the next day he came in and he was in rather a foul mood and I said hey Dave how did your uh, toilet installation go he goes don't ask it wasn't good I said did you have problems I know he said don't ask but I did anyway he said yeah he said it was terrible I said what happened he said well I put the toilet in just like you said and I thought everything was great and he goes this morning he said now this gets a little disgusting he goes I was doing the big job and he goes I I shifted my weight to clean myself and the entire toilet tipped over and spilled out I'm thinking oh my gosh this guy's having a shitty morning right now what had happened is he pulled out from his pocket the bolt that bolts the toilet down to the ground and that bolt had snapped in half now what he had bought was a brass bolt versus a solid brass bolt let me try to explain the difference between these two now a solid brass bolt might cost a dollar and a half a brass bolt might cost 50 cents now that extra dollar cost him big time you do oftentimes get what you pay for so if something says solid brass it means they've taken copper and zinc heated up to a liquid and mixed it and melted it together so it's uniformly distributed the copper and the zinc and then it's cooled off and it hardens so if you were to saw through a solid brass bolt it will be brass golden colored all the way through now brass is an alloy a mixture of metals and brass is made of copper and zinc it's a homogeneous mixture sometimes referred to as a substitutional alloy in other words you're going to substitute zinc where the copper is but it goes all the way through you don't need to know this term substitutional alloy that's unimportant but know that solid brass is homogeneous uniform throughout maybe you play a brass instrument like a trombone or baritone or sousaphone or whatever that is or trumpet right these are solid brass if you were to and please don't do this but if you cut it through it would be solid all the way through brass plated on the other hand is a heterogeneous mixture where there's zinc on the inside zinc's a relatively inexpensive metal and then they only coat the outside of the object and make that brass plated so this is a far cheaper process to do now 
legally, if they sell something at a store, they can call it brass, and it can be only coated brass. If you want it to be solid brass, there will be a sticker that will say solid brass. Sometimes you might buy candlesticks or things such as that. And there's a big difference in the quality of solid brass versus merely brass plated. The br black brass plating can come off quite easily. I remember when I was a kid, I went down to Mexico and I bought a ring and I thought it was pretty cool. The ring had a flat surface and this artisan would actually carve your name in the ring by taking out some of the metal. So uh, my name is Jeff, so he wrote Jeff in it. And it was like $10 for the ring. Kind of expensive, but not too bad. Now, I wore that ring. It looked kind of gold. And it was really, really hot in Mexico the day we went there. And I was sweating. And by the end of the day, when I took my ring off, my finger had turned green. And what that was, was the copper that was in the ring and the zinc were not mixed uniformly. And so the copper was oxidizing and turning green. It's kind of like the Statue of Liberty. When it oxidizes, it turns green as well. So when you think about those bolts, you know, you get what you pay for. A bolt that says solid brass is going to cost you more than one that says brass. If it says stainless steel, it might be $2 a bolt, but it will not rust. If you're going to use it outside, you want to pay attention to what you get. Okay? So I already mentioned about the toilet bowl. Won't talk any more about that girl story. All right. Let's talk about hardened steel. All right? Hardened steel. So if you make a bridge out of iron, one of the problems with that is that the bridge will rust. And so within five or ten years, the bridge may fail. So that's no good. So, and the other thing about iron bridges, they might look really solid, but when you put a big load on them, a lot of weight, they'll start to bow down like this. That's no good, right, if the bridge starts to sag. So what they do is they add a little bit of interstitial carbon. Remember, interstitial means in between the atoms. So the carbon fits nicely between, the carbon here is represented by the blue dots, between the atoms of the iron, the steel. And by doing this, it makes the steel much harder so that when you put a load on it, it won't bend. It might flex, but it'll return back to its original position. Now, it turns out that about 6% carbon in steel is ideal for this. If you were to add 10% carbon, the steel won't bend at all, and when it does get too much load applied, it will simply snap. So again, we're not going to spend very much time talking about alloys and engineered metals, but that is a huge area of interest that you may end up majoring in and making a career out of. I'm just trying to show you there that there's different layers of atoms, and the atoms are kind of offset of iron and the carbon fits in between in those little pockets again. So you might want something that's hardened steel if you're making wire cutters or bolt cutters because you want the, the pliers to be harder than the bolt you're cutting. Just talking about different types of steel alloys, things that you might be familiar with. Stainless steel, you have stainless steel bowls in your kitchen for mixing and if you leave water in them, they don't rust. Now, if you leave water in them for weeks at a time, they'll start to rust. We mentioned tungsten hardened steel. Tungsten has the symbol W. It uh, stands for, for Wolfram. Uh, we'll talk more about that when we get to the periodic table unit. But tungsten is the highest melting point metal. It's also what is in a filament of a light bulb. It's also the metal in your toaster that glows red hot to make your toast in the morning. Uh, and tungsten when added to steel makes it so it will not soften when it gets hot. Vanadium steel, vanadium makes it very, very, very hard. Uh, there was a, a football player, O.J. Simpson, perhaps you remember this guy, and O.J. Simpson was convicted of murdering his, his wife. Uh, the knife that was used in that murder was a three or four hundred dollar hunting knife of vanadium hardened steel the type that a butcher might use. And a butcher, if they're cutting up a cow, 
they might, as they cut the meat, cut into the bone, and that's very hard on a knife. But if it's vanadium hardened steel, the knife will stay very, very sharp that entire time. So uh, we've mentioned the addition of carbon to increase the strength. If you add too much, it becomes too brittle and snaps, not enough. It will become, it'll stay too flexible. So again, you can make different alloys. You can engineer properties of metals by combining different things with them. All right. Uh, I'm not going to go through this thing on the tensile strength. I sort of already mentioned that. Uh, yeah, I was going to give you some more examples. I think I'll pass just to save some time here. Uh, a term that I'd like you to know is galvanized. <clears throat> galvanized means zinc coated. If you have a steel nail or deck screw that you want to put on your deck, you want to buy, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm fighting a little bit of a, a little phlegm in my throat, a little bit of zinc coated or galvanized screw. Zinc won't rust, so that screw will last a lot longer if it is zinc coated. Uh, so oftentimes we will galvanize things to be used outside. The last thing I'll mention is if you take two different metals and you allow them to make contact with each other, there's something called uh, galvanic reduction. And the metals will actually, one will dissolve the other metal. So you have to be a little careful with that. Uh, if you take AP Chem or Advanced Chem, we'll talk a lot more about electrochemistry and how that works. But for right now, this lesson is just dealing with allotropes and alloys. Uh, I just mentioned, I see the little picture of the Tin Man here from Wizard of Oz. The original person who was supposed to be the Tin Man was Buddy Epson. If you know the show uh, Beverly Hillbillies, he was the father. And when that movie was originally made, the way they tried to make him look like the Tin Man was they took glue and sprayed it all over his body and then they took powdered tin and they sprayed it all over his body to stick and he ended up inhaling a lot of that and was hospitalized for many months and so the role was given to somebody else uh, then they used a different type process probably a, a, a smeared on ointment that had metal in it, aluminum dust instead of spray it in his face to make him look like the Tin Man Alright, uh, the last thing I'll tell you about is Nitinel wire. Uh, I used to have some of this and I think it got stolen by a student or maybe another teacher, I don't really know. But it's an alloy of nickel and titanium. And the coolest thing about it is it starts off as a straight wire. And then what you do is you hold it over a flame and bend it into a shape and then you uh, let it cool off and then you can straighten it out and then as soon as you apply heat again it will instantly go back to that bent shape so my piece was pretty long and I wrote out in cursive the word chem for chemistry by bending it, heating it, and cooling it in that process and it was neat I mean I could just hold that wire up and it looked like a regular wire and then I would hit it with a hair dryer and it would right in front of your eyes write the word chem that was pretty cool. Now, they use knit nail wire, it's called memory wire, for lots of things. They sometimes will put it in shirts, they'll put a small amount of it in to make a permanent crease in maybe your pants. Or when you put your clothes in the dryer, they won't need ironing. Right? It does cost more. Or they can, if there's a very difficult sh surgery they might have to do in your, in your shoulder, they can make a very small incision, put that in, apply uh, an electric current to heat it up, and it will automatically start to coil around and do whatever needs to be done. So look up Nitinel Wire if you're interested in that. Look it up on, on Wikipedia, and I think it's pretty cool. All right. Well, thanks for listening to me. I hope you're more clear on what an allotrope is, the, an element in the same state of matter with different properties because of how it's put together and you're clear what an alloy is, a mixture of metals that has maybe different properties from the elements it was made from. So allotropes and alloys, that's what we learned about today. Again, thanks for joining me. Have a good day. Bye-bye.